Hi, this is James from Cerritos Dental, and then we're doing our first of our implant videos. It's basically explaining to you what implants are and how everything's going to be, okay? So the goal of these videos is basically to educate, number one, dental professionals, also my staff, and I guess other dentists as well, and also our potential patients and our also current patients. And lastly, anyone that's interested in dental implants. So. A lot of this material is going to be very dense and very complicated. I do apologize beforehand, so if I get too many hate mails, then you know what, I'll go ahead and stop making these videos. If not, I guess we'll continue if people have an interest in these videos and if, the, if everyone starts learning something, okay? So as I said before, it is very complex and very dense. So the upside is, you know, by the time you finish all these videos, you will know more than most dentists because most dentists only take about few CE courses a year and most of them don't are not up to date on the current research literature. Because, I mean, we see a lot of crazy stuff with implants, so if everyone knew what they were doing, we probably wouldn't see a lot of these crazy cases. So, good or bad, I don't know. Yeah, I guess you could be the judge for that. In addition, just might make note that we receive no sponsorship or endorsement. So basically, you know, we are very bias-free. Everything that we're telling you from these videos is basically based on our own experiences and what most of the current research literature says. Okay? Moving on, so the topics that we're going to cover today is, number one, what is a dental implant, just for anyone that doesn't know. Number two, we're going to cover implant brands. And the third, last topic we're going to cover today is zero bone loss, the goal of implant dentistry. First subject, what is a dental implant? So a dental implant is essentially a titanium screw that is placed in your mouth that fuses with the jawbone. Although now currently there's actually other materials other than titanium such as zirconium but an office that has been placing implants for over 15 years we would recommend against zirconium implants currently. So a dental implant is basically as we said before titanium screw that goes into your mouth. So if you look on the picture on the slide right here you see on the left side that's a natural tooth. On the right side that's an implant supported tooth. So essentially the implant is designed to mimic a natural tooth in, t in terms of having a root or what the implant is proposed and then having a crown on the very top. One more thing about implants is to keep in mind implants are designed to replace missing tooth or unsavable tooth. Implants are not designed to replace healthy tooth or teeth that can be saved. So we've seen a lot of stuff crazy stuff out there before so you know as we said before implants are only designed to place missing tooth. We had patients come in that said, you know, their dentist told them to pull out the tooth and do an implant because they couldn't fit a crown on the tooth. So a lot of that stuff makes no sense. So if your doctor tells you something that really makes no sense or you really scratch your head, my advice is go out, get a second opinion, okay? Another question that we get asked a lot is, is implant safe? Well, implants were actually originally discovered by Professor Brandemark, a Swedish professor. So back in the early 60s and 70s when he conducted most of his research regarding osteointegration, so that's based essentially implants fusing with your natural jawbone, okay? So implants in general are very safe and it's been around, I mean, most of, a lot of implants were placed in the 1980s. That's when the implants really first got started commercially. So they've been around for 40 years and the current literature and the current success rate for implants is still very, very high. Although now, just we have different standards of what defined implant success is currently versus 40 years ago. Moving on, there's three components to an implant. You see a picture on the left, that's this implant model, has all three components combined. The picture to your right essentially breaks down each component of the implant. So the, the one in the middle, the titanium screw, that's what we call the implant body. The picture on the right in the middle, the gold color, that's the implant abutment. And the final portion is going to be the implant crown. So the implant body, abutment, crown, all three combined make up one implant. Although there are other types of implants out there, for our purposes and for most people, these are the three basic components for an implant. So the second topic we're going to cover today is, does, do the implant brands matter? So this is something we get a lot because there's a lot of patients come in, oh, do you carry this brand? Oh, I heard this brand was the best. Oh, that brand is the best. So in general, does implant brands matter? Well, the answer to that is simply not really. It's more what matters for implant in terms of longevity and having it last is the implant design and your surgical technique. So now we're gonna go in over that, what we in detail what that means. So in 2007, the University of Frankfurt in Germany, they conducted a very in-depth study regarding what, what, what makes a good implant good or not. 
So what they were testing is basically the connection. So the connection between the implant abutment and the implant body. So if you remember from our previous slide, that's going to be the, port, the gray metal and on the on the right picture, the one on the left, and the gold portion. So these between the connections for these. So they were testing out what makes a good implant. Okay. So this is what their studies found. This is a Nobel implant. Okay. So essentially, in the study, what they did was they hit the implant with a certain amount of force and they recorded it with a microscope, essentially to see, record a video camera or a microscope to record any micro movements between the abutment and the crown, excuse me, implant body. So what I want you to focus on is this area here, the area in the red, because that is where basically the abutment and the implant body meet up. So any micro gaps are basically what we call micro gap is any space that basically exists between the implant body and the implant abutment. Why this is important because, as you know, bacteria is in your saliva. Saliva is all throughout your mouth. So any gaps or any space, bacteria is going to get in. Bacteria penetrates into the, these micro caps. It basically colonizes and starts building up. And ultimately, the bacteria in there will start causing bone loss in your mouth. So basically, causes instability towards the implant. So basically, we're going to take a look at the video again. And basically, you're going to see the micro gap movements from a Nobel implant, okay? And essentially here's a basically another video showing the micro movement up close. So when people say, oh, I want Nobel implants, Nobel are the best, most of these people never actually seen the research. That's just not to say that Nobel is not a good implant, but they are, in terms of micro gaps, micro movements, they are not necessarily have the best connections available in implants that is available on the market today. This next implant we're going to see is a Strowman implant. Okay, so we're going to do this same thing as before. I want you to focus on the area between the implant abutment and the implant body. Okay, so on the next video, take a look at it to see if there's any micro gaps. Okay, so with the Strowman implant, you see the micro gaps are a little bit smaller, but even then, there still exist mi micro gaps. Okay. The next implant is an ankylos implant. Areas that I want you to focus on, same thing, between the implant body and the implant abutment. And you can also see from the design, the ankylos implant is a little bit different than the strawman and the Nobel implant. Actually, the ankylos implant is actually much different than almost any other implant on the market available today. And was there any micro gap you're asking yourself? According to the research, no. No micro gap was detected, or micro movement was detected when these implants were hit. Okay, and now we're going to move on to our final implant. This is the AstroTech implant. This is the area that I want you to focus on. Okay, so based on the studies, the only two implants that were found not to have micro gaps or micro movements were the Ankylos and AstroTech implants. Both of those implants belong to Dentspy. So when people ask you what brands, you know, what is the best? Well, in terms of connection wise, I could tell you what is the best implant. It's going to be AstroTech and Ankylos. You see a number of different implants on there. Almost 60 to 70% of the implants available on the market today were actually based off the AstroTech implants because the connection was so well made. It's very, very hard for bacteria to get in. So very well designed implants. So you see some of the other brands on there, I, mean, I won't name them, to, but if you ask anyone that places implants, anyone that knows about implant design, they're all going to tell you these are variations of the AstroTech implant. So in, back in terms, back to, to, to determine or in, implants brands. So as we, oh, yeah, cut that out. Sorry. Okay, whenever you're ready, go ahead. So in terms of implant brand, it's not necessarily always whoever is basically the largest brand necessarily have the best implants. It's kind of the same concept as a Rolex watch. Are Rolex, do Rolex is makes the best watch in the world? Not necessarily, right? But they have a biggest marketing branding behind it. Same thing with implants. Some of these companies have a very large marketing. They, some of these brands actually spend more on their marketing than their research and development. So that's where people hear these implants 
they automatically assume they are the best implant. So don't always trust the manufacturer or the salespeople. You know, you have to really understand the science of it to really understand which implants are preferred. The next topic we're going to cover is zero bone loss, the goal of implant dentistry. So implant dentistry, as we said before, started in the 1980s. Back then, the goal for implants and the goals that exist today is much different. Back then in the early 80s, if you placed an implant and the implant integrated in the mouth, that was considered a success. How long the implant lasted, what did it look like, none of those factors mattered. As long as you receive, achieve osseointegration, which is basically when the implant body fuses to the bone in your mouth, that was considered a success. Today, 40 years later, the goals for success, it's a little bit different. So the biggest components or biggest reasons why implants fail is because due to bone loss. So one of the reasons, for, I mean, to combat that, the whole goal in implant dentistry today is to maintain as much bone as possible because people are living much longer. You don't want your implants to last you five or 10 years. You want your implants to last you 20 or 30 years. So the, li the, the lesser amount of bone that you lose, the more stable your implants can be over time. So one of the concepts that basically is understood in terms of zero bone loss is there has to be four factors. So the first factor is subcrestal implant placement. The second is platform switch implant design. Number three is conical connection implant design. And number four, Morse tapered implant design. We're gonna go into each of these things, topics to basically explain in detail what they, what they are. So the first thing is subcrestal. What that means is place the implant deep, as deep as you can possibly go. So if you see from this picture right here, the one on the left, that's a tissue level implant. Tissue level implants were made famous by Strawman. So the ones on your right, these are what they call bone level implants. So if you look on the picture, the pink portion line right there, that represents the gum. The white layer right there, that represents the bone. So what we do in terms, what we say in terms of subcrestal means, place it below the bone line. So what you see the picture on here, we want to place the implants even deeper than what the picture is. So your implant should be where the white line is, not where the, imp not where the pink line is, not where the gum is, okay? This is another picture that shows basically subcresto. So if you see from the picture here, the implant is very, very deep, much below the gum lines, and basically where the implants start, that's essentially where the bone is. That's where the bone is for the patient. So people ask, why do you want to place it so deep? What is the rationale for that? So one of the rationale for s placing the implant subcrestal is number one, is the, is the concept of biological width. So biological width, what does it mean? Well, just to summarize, basically says you should have two to three millimeters of tissue above the implant. If you don't have two or three mil millimeters of gums above your implants, basically the body will destroy whatever bone that is regenerated to create two to three millimeters of soft tissue because that's just, a, that, that's just a natural thing of the body. For natural teeth, you generally have two to three millimeters of gum. Same thing for implants. When you, your body has an implant in there, the body will want to have two to three millimeters of gums. So you see, see on the picture, there's a lot of technical terms here, junctional epithelium, sulcular epithelium. If you don't understand any of this stuff and you don't want to, just think of it very simply. You need to have gum. The more gums, the better. So the second reason why we want to place our implant very deep is because most patients experience one millimeter bone loss after their first year of having their implants placed. So in 1997, Professor Abramson and his group, they published an article basically detailing why they thought, or from what they found, why people lose basically what, what, what that is. We placed implants on these dogs. One side of the mouth, they would just let the implants completely alone. The other side of the mouth, they would take out the abutment, clean it, and put it back, and they'd do that once every month for six months. At the end of the six month study, what they did was they would kill all the dogs, and then they would basically section off the piece of portion of the jaw, and basically and see what occurred. So this is the, basically the summary for Professor Abelson's study. And the side that they removed and reconnected the implants six times, there was about 1.5 millimeter of gum loss and about one millimeter of bone loss. So Professor Abramson came to the conclusion that releasing the implants multiple times, above multiple times, 
had damage to soft tissue. When you damage a soft tissue, inevitably it causes bone loss. Implant dentistry would be the same thing. After you have the implants placed, you need to put on a helium abutment. After the helium abutment, you need to basically take an impression, send it to a lab. So all during this time, you're disturbing and playing around with the tissue. So essentially what they found was, if you do that five times or more, you will experience one millimeter of bone loss. So this is why most implant patients experience one millimeter of bone loss plus gum loss the first year of implants. So this next slide basically shows you, on the left side of the picture, basically the connective tissues for a natural tooth. On the right side, the gums on the implant. So if you see on the left side, there's a lot more lines running through it, a lot more blood veins, a lot more Sharpie's fiber. On the right side, there is still the same connections, but there's not as much of it. So therefore, keep in mind, when you have your implants placed, implant, the gums around implants are not as strong, are not as connected as your natural tissue. And one of the main reasons for that is, there's no blood supply on the implant body itself. Implant body is made of titanium. There's no way to feed it blood supply. Therefore, most of the Sharpie fibers, most of the, these nerves, what they call periodontal ligament, grows on the bone, away from the implant. So therefore, the connection around implants is a little bit different than the connection around your natural tooth. Next slide is just basically showing an electron microscope, showing the implant body connected to, to your gums. So in summary, we want to place implant deep because number one, biological width. We need to have adequate gums surrounding the implants. The second reason is that most patients will experience one millimeter bone loss their first year. And number three, if you experience bone loss in the future, if you place it very deep, that will compensate it. Your implants will still be much stable in the future. Okay, so now moving on to the second topic and the second reason of how to achieve zero bone loss. So the second implant, the second way of experiencing zero bone loss is also has to do with implant design. This is something that also came out in the current literature much more, we know much more about it now than we did 15, 20 years ago. So on this slide, I want you to focus on each of those implants. Each of those implants, look at the yellow area that's highlighted. So for the first implant, the one that's purple, the first one on your left, let's take a look at it. The dark gray portion, that's the implant body. The portion above that where it's more chrome or silver-like, that's the implant abutment. Okay? The next one, same thing. Implant body, implant abutment. Third one, same thing. So for the first one, if you see where the silver part each, the dark gray part, essentially they're the same level. So this is what they call a platform match implant, meaning the implant abutment is the same size as the implant body. The second and third one, you're going to see basically the implant abutment and the implant body are not the same size. So basically, if you look at it, the contours of it is a little bit different. If you see on the second one, it basically concaves in and then it flares out. Same thing with also the third one. You see, it caves in and then it flares out. So these are what they call platform switch implants. So that current literature, the more aggressive the platform switch, the better. Now we're going to get to the reason why. So the, above, this is, is a platform match implant. The x-ray on the bottom, this is a platform switch implant. So when the plat as we said, most implants have basically micro gaps or micro movements. As we said before, micro gaps and micro movements collect bacteria, right? So therefore, if, if it's a platform match implant, the bacteria is going to stay on the bone. Platform switch kind of moves it away from the bone. So right now, you guys might not have any idea what I'm talking about, but the next slide is going to make it a little bit more clear, okay? So this is, the, as you said before, this is the area that I want you guys to focus on. The areas in the yellow, okay? So if you take a look at it, on this slide, if you take a look basically at, at the bottom picture, you can see from here. This is a platform switch implant. So basically the connection is away from the bone, it's on the gum side. So therefore, any bacteria that collects is away from the bone. So you guys might think, well this doesn't make a big difference, right? It's only a few millimeters, why does that make such a big difference? Well, 
In implant dentistry, millimeters makes a world of difference. Every measurement that we do in dentistry is in terms of millimeter. Having it away just that far away from the bone means you're able to protect the bone that much better. As we said before, bacteria is in your saliva, and saliva is in fluid form, so basically it spreads all throughout your mouth. So basically any nooks and crannies, any micro gaps, any areas where there's a crack, bacteria is able to get in. So now let's go ahead and take a look at a few of these concepts in real life. So you see on this implant, this actually technically would be considered a platform switch, but you see it's not a ag very aggressive switch. The implant's just a little bit off the bone. This is a six-year post-op picture. So you see from this, on this implant right here, there is what they call crestal bone loss. Crestal means the bone at the top of the implant, at the ridge of it. So there is implant bone loss on this implant. This is the area that I want you to focus on when you're taking a look at it. The next implant, same thing. It's a platform match implant, so also you have crestal bone loss. Bone loss at the top of the implant, but after a certain while, the implant bone loss becomes stabilized. This is the area that I want you to focus on, okay? Now we're gonna move on to a platform switch implant. So this is a four-year post-op on the implant. And if we take a look at it, area look on, zero bone loss. Four years after the implant was placed, the patient has not lost any bone, or if he has lost any bone, the implant is still completely encased in bone. And if we take a look at it, the implant abutment is much smaller than the implant body itself. So essentially, it's, this is why they call it platform switch. It moves the gap or moves the connection portion away from the bone. <coughs> so looking at these three pictures, which implant would you want? Hopefully by now you guys are familiar with x-rays, but if you're not familiar, the bottom implant. That's what you guys want. Four years later, no bone loss. So if patients maintain the well, he should still be able to use the same implant another 10, 15 years. No problem, provided he has good oral hygiene and he maintains his oral hygiene. Moving on, the next topic we're going to talk about today is conical connection. So if you take a look at this slide, there's four different implants here. The second implant to your left, you see the green one, these were the external hexes. So the original Branamark implants actually had an external connection, meaning they were above the bone line and also above gum to gum line. So not commonly used anymore. Nowadays, everyone's moving towards the internal connection. So that's what we're gonna focus on because most of the implants that are placed today are internal connections. So out of the internal connection, there's a few different implants. So the first that we're gonna see is a trilobe, which is an implant that the Nobel BioCare made very famous with the replace implants. The second is just an internal hex, I guess standard for any, any implants, a lot of the implant brands carry them. And the third implant is a conical connection. So the third one is what we wanna focus on more because that is the, what's basically the favorite implant today in, in implant dentistry. 10 years ago, there was still debate over which implant was best or which one had the best connection. Today, there's not much debate anymore. Everyone's moving towards conical. All the implant manufacturers are coming out with conical connection because from all the research and all the studies, it basically has the best connection. And why would we go over that in detail? So here's another slide basically detailing the difference between an internal hex connection and a conical style connection. So right now, it's very hard to, for you people that don't do, are not associated with implants to basically conceptualize, like, why does it matter, right? They essentially, they look the same. What's the difference between the two? So in order to fully explain the difference and why importance of why a conical connection is the best, we have to move on to our next topic. But the short answer is, essentially, you don't want to have any micro gaps or micro movements, as we mentioned earlier, between the implant abutment and the implant body. So the tighter the fit, the better the seal, the better the connection, the better the implant. So this is actually implant connection type by a dental lab. So this is actually from a very famous dental lab, and this is the statistics that they compiled. So essentially, whenever doctors do an implant, they send basically the case to the lab. And these are the cases that the dental lab are saying that they're seeing. So if you see, take a look at 2011, a lot of the implants that were placed were non-conical connection, kind of for 52% of the market. 
Conoco at that time only counted for about 21% of the market. And then if you look at 2012, well, you see a decrease in non-Conoco connection types. And you see an increase in both the internal hex and the Conoco. And every year thereafter, you see basically Conoco and internal hex keep on growing in terms of market share. And essentially the non-Conoco connections, they start tapering off, right? People are doing less and less and less of them. So based on the current trends, even from the dental lab, that's where the trend is moving towards. Every, all the implant manufacturers are moving towards a conical connection. And we're gonna see in the next slides, a couple slides, why that is. To fully understand the conical connection, as you mentioned earlier, you have to understand what is a Morse tapered connection. So Morse taper was actually invented in 1864 by Stephen Morse, who is actually a mechanic, not a dentist, not a doctor, actually it doesn't even have anything to do with dental, dental field or implant dentistry. However, what's important about Stephen Morris is the fact that he invented the Morse taper connection, which is named after for him. Essentially, he essentially initially invented it for drilling machines. And what the Morse taper connection, essentially, if you take a look at these slides, is it's a cone within a cone. So if you want to get into the very nitty gritty details, you know, there has a lot to do with degrees, angles, but this taper connection, there's a male portion and a female portion. They both have to be tapered, and because they're both tapered, it's a very tight fit. So if none of that makes sense to you, just think, you know, Morse taper connection is a cone within a cone. So looking at it, these are on the top. For dental implants, these will be the female portion, the implant body. Below that is the implant abutment, which is considered the male portion of it. So if you take a look at the slides on the bottom, this is what an implant and the abutment look like after the implant abutment has been inserted into the implant. So the one in the middle, that's the Morse tapered connection. You see how basically if you look at the where the connections meet, it has kind of has a V or a very cone shape. That's what we're trying to go for. Because that long cone shape and the tapered connection it's a very, very tight fit. And because of that tight fit, it's very hard for bacteria to get in. So Morse taper connection, people who actually first started using it was actually in orthopedic surgery. So it's actually commonly used in, in the medical field. So for, in terms of dental implants, the male conical connection is tightened into the female conical co connection. And basically what keeps it in, in place is the high significant stress or friction between the two parallel joints. Okay, so this next phenomenon is cold, called cold welding. And cold welding is essentially when you have two pieces of metal and you put a significant amount of force between them, it essentially creates a new surface on between the two metals. So it seals any portions of it. So with the implant, when you compress these two metals, it essentially creates a new seal and it's very, very hard for bacteria to get in after the conical implant has been cold welded. So if we take a look at this slide right here, we see two different implant systems. Both of them by the manufacturer claim that these are conical connections, but if we take a look at it, you see the implant on the right, that's more of a true conical connection type. Not that the one on the left is a bad connection, but if you look at it, based on your slides you saw before, more tapered connection, conical connection, it's a much better connection type. And which implant is the one on the right? Well, once again, that's the AstroTech implant. As I said before, the most copied implant currently on the market right now. A very strong connection, very good. So what do we get from all this? Well, it's just that, keep in mind, based on these four factors, are basically how, we, how we're able to achieve zero bone loss. So number one, place the implants deep, subcrestally. Number two, have a platform switch implant. Number three, have the implant have a conical connection, and number four, make sure that it's a Morse tapered connection. So that's it for this video. I hope I didn't bore you guys to death. So if you have any questions, feel free to email us at help at I hope you enjoyed it, and this, I guess, will be the first of many videos to come. Perfect. Thank you.